So the film centers around Aldo, who plays... Okay, try again. <laughs> Hey there, Fiber Junkies! Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. And today I have another Saturday Night at the Movies! This is my favorite part of the podcast where we take a film that features some type of fiber arts. Usually knitting or crochet, but sometimes spinning, weaving, embroidery, sewing, anything having to do with fiber. And it could be just a flash of someone knitting in the corner, or it could be an entire plot or scene revolving around the fiber arts. But we take a film that has some type of fiber arts in it, and we give a quick review, chat about it a little bit, and then pair it with a knitting or crochet pattern that is reminiscent of the film, either in the era, the style, or just something about it is uh, reminiscent of the movie, or the plot, or the story, or something. I really love doing this. It's a really fun opportunity for me to talk about one of my favorite things, which is old vintage cinema, but it also gives us a fun little activity to do to find new patterns and um, kind of look at them in a unique and interesting way. If you have a great idea for a Saturday night at the movies, something that features some type of fiber arts in it, leave me a comment below and let me know which film you think I should do next. It doesn't have to just be vintage cinema, although that's what we've stuck to so far since starting this a year and a half ago. We've done all old movies so far, but we could do modern movies as well. So just leave me a comment and let me know what film you know of that has fiber arts in it that we should do. If you've left me comments before and we still haven't gotten to your video yet, that's because there are so many to do. I'm working my way down a very long list and I'm constantly adding to it as I come across films with more scenes in them. So rest assured we have a ways to go before we exhaust this uh, resource. Today I wanted to take us on a little trip back to mid-century um, and visit the 1950s. This is a very misunderstood era, I think. I think a lot of people um, don't really know specifically the difference between the 1950s and like even as far back as the 20s, but especially the, the decades on either side, the 40s through the 60s, all gets lumped in together in the 1950s. But the film we're doing today is a great example um, from a fashion standpoint of just a really kind of typical 1950s look and feel. The, the fashion is just very like everyday, ordinary, middle-class American 1950s look. Um, and the theme of the story is actually revolves very much around pretty much a normal everyday kind of a couple. So it's really based in um, kind of a realism that's a little bit, uh, it's, it kind of presents as a bit of like a lighthearted comedy when you first um, approach the film, but as you get into it, you quickly realize that it's really kind of more gritty, a little more realistic, um, and it has common themes that run through all eras when it comes to love, marriage, and relationships, and just the, the difficulties and the struggles of everybody's day-to-day -day life. Everyone has different struggles, so you're not going to experience the exact same struggles as the characters in the film, but the common thread is that everybody has struggles and we all um, experience them and they are life-changing and life-altering for us um, regardless of what type of struggle it is. It really shapes who we become and that's kind of what this film is about. So it kind of seems like it's going to be like just kind of lighthearted romantic comedy at first but you quickly realize that's not the direction this is going and by the end of the film you've been taken on a roller coaster of everything from just like kind of silly hilarious like, oh my gosh, did they really even do that? To all the way to really, really deep, moving, emotional scenes um, and everything in between. So it's a very well-rounded film. This film features a classic actress of the 1950s, um, but one that you might not be as familiar with unless you are um, definitely an old movie buff because she actually started and was even more popular on Broadway, and that is Judy Holliday. She is a funny voiced, kind of funny faced little um, cute pixie of a, of a gal and she was famous in the 1950s for a, a host of um, kind of upbeat, funny comedies and musicals, uh, but she had a, amazing dramatic depths as an actress. She really honed her chops on Broadway and um, was quite an accomplished actress before she made her films and uh, in all of her films, even the kind of silly comedies, you can see some really emotional depth that she was able to uh, get at just with something as simple as the way she makes her eyes look or the way they kind of like dart across, um, the way she kind of holds her shoulders, the way she moves, even in the way that she dresses and wears her clothes. Uh, she was very, very good at 
showing a wide range of emotions, especially in roles that could very easily become caricatured, one-dimensional kind of jokes. Uh, she was able to still play them off with the comedy or the like ridiculousness that the character called for, and yet still kind of show that more human, really, really deep side. So she's a very amazing actress. Um, she won the Oscar in 1950 for the Best Actress, much to her own shock and dismay, and I think a lot of other people's as well, but she really was quite accomplished. Um, really, really excellent. And this film shows a wide range of her emotional talents as well. So what is our film? This month we are doing a film from 1952 called The Marrying Kind. This film stars Judy Holliday and Aldo Ray, who is someone that you may not be as familiar with, um, although he did do quite a few films, in, especially in the 1950s. He's got a really gruff kind of palooka sounding voice. He's very, um, he kind of played characters who are rough around the edges, uh, a little bit low class. He was definitely more of like a blue collar type actor. Those were the characters he traditionally portrayed, largely because of his husky kind of gruff voice. And he was a rather large kind of imposing man, had an athletic build and a face that wasn't particularly intelligent. Um, he, uh, he really did well in those types of roles and he made them his own and really um, kind of became a character actor. He had a very specific type of role that he played. And uh, this is no different than a lot of his other films in that type of character. But what is interesting about this film is this gave him the chance to really, really show what he could do as an actor is as far as like deep emotional scenes and connecting with um, the other cast members in very uh, more subtle unique ways that he often didn't get to display in other roles. He has had a variety of other films of course but I really think this one um, allows him a subtlety that he doesn't get in some of his other films so it's worth watching for that alone. The film centers around a couple named Chet and Flory, and in the beginning of the film we see them entering the divorce court. They are here to get a divorce, and the judge that is uh, hearing their case decides that she is going to speak to them afterwards, uh, kind of privately, and just get to hear their story. So she takes them in her private chambers and asks them about how they met, and what led them from meeting and deciding to get married all the way up to the divorce court. What, what brought them here? So they share their story in bits and pieces over the course of the film and we see them cutting back and forth between memories of their time to the modern day setting where they're discussing these memories and these um, pivotal moments in their relationship and how that changed them and brought them to this divorce court. So in the beginning of their courtship they have a little meet cute, they meet each other, um, you know, just, just a boy and a girl like every every other uh, couple in middle class America at the time. They meet, they decide to get married after a few dates. Um, they marry with a lot of love and not a lot of money and uh, kind of build their way up from there. Their struggles with the in-laws, struggles with each other and just getting used to married life um, and all of these kinds of things. Chet is working in the post office and Floria is a homemaker, although she does have another job um, before they get married, which causes some tension uh, with her giving up her job and him um, feeling jealous of her old boss and different things like that. So we already see the groundwork being laid, as it is in most relationships, I think, for uh, potential issues down the road. As they go through their story, they chat about um, having kids and how their relationship with their families changed over time and how having children kind of affected them. There is uh, great successes and excitement, there's jealousies, there is lies, pain, betrayal, arguments, fights, um, some seriously tragic events. So we're laying all this groundwork leading up to the divorce and we start to see how there are little themes of um, kind of betrayal and pain, and some pride issues going on, some hurt feelings that kind of don't get resolved and they build into resentment that bubbles up later on. Some, and we, one of the things that I think is most poignant about the film is we see how tragedy and disappointment and discouragement um, around certain pivotal events in their marriage really start to break down their relationship. We see how that tragedy or that pain or that betrayal affects each of them and how they start to pull away, they start to blame each other, they start to uh, change the way that they speak to each other, the way they treat each other, the way they approach it. Um, and so you can kind of start to see the groundwork being laid. 
For me as a married woman, I see that as really, really important because uh, sometimes when we watch other people go through it, it kind of gives you that little wake up call of like, oh wow, I can see how that led to that. And it's really easy when you're watching a two hour film and you can step back away from it, you're not emotionally involved and you can see it in someone else's life. But it kind of gives you that little um, wake up call of how is that happening in my life? Where, where am I allowing those jealousies or those resentments or those painful moments to really build a bridge or, or build a wall between me and my spouse or, um, you know, and it doesn't just have to be a marriage relationship, although I think that is where it is most visceral and real a lot of times because uh, you're literally living with the person, but it can be with you and the best friend, you and a roommate, you and a mom or a child or whoever, and you start to see how you build those walls instead of using that to build a bridge. So I wouldn't really call this a comedy, although there are some lighthearted moments. It's really more of a realistic, kind of dramatic look um, at a marriage. And uh, even though it's a fictionalized account, it's really meant to kind of hold a mirror up to our own lives, both in our romantic relationships, but also I think in all of our relationships this can apply, where we can allow the daily tragedies, the daily wear and tear, and the fam the familiarity that breeds contempt to start to creep into our relationships and cause us to pull apart from people and build up walls and only see things from our own perspective instead of being willing to compromise, listen to the other person, and give a little while still um, maintaining our own dignity. So it's a really interesting, kind of realistic picture. But there are some lighthearted moments and like I mentioned, there's some great fashion and there are knitting scenes. So let's talk about those. In this film, uh, there is no big like moment where knitting just shines. In fact, if you blink, you miss it. You might not even know it's there. Um, and uh, there's actually a couple scenes and they're sort of just scattered in there. So when Flory is talking to her, um, I can't remember if it's her sister or her sister-in-law, but I think it's her sister-in-law, uh, but she's talking to family a couple of different times in the film. You can see the sister is knitting something. We don't know what. But uh, there's some there's some scenes like that where there's just a little bit of knitting in the background. And again, if you blink, you miss it, but it is there. So I decided that counts, and we're going to use that as our fiber arts for this month in June. That brings me to our pattern. I am really excited about this month's pattern. I actually was going to do something different, but it was uh, just a pattern I found in a book. It wasn't something that I've ever knit before. So I was just going to give it as like, a, this looks cute and fun. You should give this a try. But then I decided I wanted to show you, I really prefer to show you when I have something actually knit or crocheted or something that I'm in the middle of working on because I think those are just more fun to see. And so I wanted to show you something that I am almost finished with and I'm in the process of doing the finishing and sewing up and everything. This month's pattern is the Marion Sweater by Andy Satterland. This beautiful design is a really a quick, easy knit for a more experienced knitter, but it's simple enough and um, has a large enough gauge that it wouldn't be too intimidating for a beginning garment knitter. I think it would be something really, really easy you could do. And the fun part about it is it's beautifully written as is, and it has a kind of subtly vintage look and feel to it, but you could easily extend the body and make it a longer, more modern top. You could uh, knit a slightly higher gauge and um, or a larger size and make it a little roomier and more of like a slouchy modern pullover, um, or excuse me, modern cardigan if you want, um, as opposed to the vintage look. But I prefer the vintage look, so I wrote, I did the pattern as written, and um, I did size down just a little so there'd be a bit of negative ease, which the pattern does uh, kind of give you some guidance on that. I just cast this off last night, so I just finished the knitting part last night, and I wove in some ends. Um, I do actually have to block it still, so it's not completely done. It's looking a little like scary. I haven't done, I haven't blocked the neckband part or anything yet, so it's kind of curling up a little bit. But I will be blocking it uh, hopefully this weekend, and then I need to sew some buttons on, and then it will all be done. But I got the knitting part finished, and so I wanted to show it to you. I chose this pattern because it does have a vintage kind of aesthetic to it. It's a little cropped cardigan, so it's meant to just hit right at or slightly below your natural waistline. It looks really, really great with like high-waisted pants or a high-waisted skirt, but it also looks adorable over a little like sundresses or something. And then the sleeves as written are pretty much full length or they're kind of more like bracelet length, which is a very vintage 1950s aesthetic. 
In the 1950s, costume jewelry was all the rage, and so you didn't have to have a lot of money to have big clunky jewelry everywhere and have matching sets of bracelet, earrings, necklace, tiara, whatever. Costume jewelry made things much more affordable, and so, um, and the 50s was the matchy matchy era, so you'd have matching earrings, matching necklace, matching bracelet, maybe a matching ring, um, and that would be your look for the evening. So to show off all these amazing, fun faux bubbles, people would really get into bracelet length sleeves or rolling back their sleeves so you could show off a really nice cuff bracelet. So a lot of the sleeves would hit kind of right in this mid, um, what is that, mid, I don't even know what part of the arm it is. I'm sleep deprived and my brain is stopped. Uh, it would hit about here, <laughs> so it wouldn't go all the way down to your wrist so that you could still have a nice drippy little bracelet or a cuff or something there. Um, but you could shorten it and make it more like just below the elbow for another kind of vintage aesthetic, or you could even make short sleeves if you prefer, or you can extend it all the way to your wrist or even past if you like long sleeves that you can roll back. It's really up to you, but as written, the, the pattern pictures kind of show it hitting right about here, which is where I wanted mine to fall as well because I liked that length quite a bit. I also really like the cropped body on this um, because I do wear a lot of high-waisted vintage style um, silhouettes. I really like that look, but as I mentioned, you could easily just extend the body part if you wanted. And um, what I love about this sweater is kind of this little uh, slight v-neck at the top. So um, once I get mine blocked and the buttons sewn on, there are going to be buttons down at the waistline and then it's going to kind of open up into this little nice V so that you can see the front part of your bodice of a dress or a top or something. And so this makes a really great little cardigan to just throw on. Um, this is a very classic look and a lot of the timeless classic looks really became popular or were invented in the 1950s. So a lot of kind of traditional classic cardigan looks and things that we wear today and think are perfectly modern are based on designs that were very popular and trendy in the 1950s, like this one. I really love this little cable detail that runs up the side. It's a little hard to see unblocked, but it has this great cable detail. And um, the cables really make a nice little interesting element, but the rest of the body is just stockinette, so that keeps it pretty simple and easy because you just have this one simple cable right along each edge, and the cardigan is knit in one piece. So you knit it from the top down in one piece and then go back and pick up stitches for the sleeves, which means that there's very little sewing. It's basically just some weaving in of the ends. You even pick up the knit band and knit it right onto the sweater. So again, no sewing there either. You just got to pick up some stitches. I love this type of construction. This is very modern construction, not at all 1950s, and I love that. I love vintage styles with modern tools and techniques. Um, and I really hate having to sew my knitting, so I love that this doesn't require that. The sleeves are beautifully written if you follow the pattern. I think Andy Satterland just does an amazing job of shaping sleeve caps so you get the look of set-in sleeves without having to do sewing. You can just pick up stitches, do a few short rows, and then knit down, and it just, they fit beautifully. Every garment I've ever made from one of her patterns is just really excellent fit in the sleeves and the shoulders, and I love that. I think she's done an amazing job, and I love how simple and easy that was for me to do as well. The color I'm using is one of my hand-dyed yarns. Um, this is not a color you will find in my shop regularly because this was actually a one-of-a-kind batch, and uh, I only had a few skeins of it, and I decided I was going to put it in the shop, and then I was looking for something to cast on one night when I was really tired and I didn't want to spend a lot of time looking through yarn and I was like, hey, I want to knit that Andy Satterland pattern and it doesn't take that much yarn. I just need some worsted weight. And I was like, oh yeah, I have that ugly oopsie batch that I could just knit myself. It's not actually ugly. It's a really pretty like amber golden color with little uh, flashes of brown throughout it. Um, and I do really like it, but this was a test batch. I was reformulating an old colorway that wasn't working out anymore. I wanted to get my brass goggles colorway from uh, the very first couple months I had my shop open. I had this lovely antique yellow called brass goggles, and it just wasn't working for me anyways. Um, as I grew as a dyer, I started to kind of hone my color skills even more, and I was like, I love the base of this color, but I don't like how greenish it's become over the years as I recreate it. It just always looks a little off. So I decided to reformulate, and over the last year I've done probably six or eight versions of this color. 
<laughs> and um, most of them have been fails. <laughs> um, I've learned something from each batch though, so I keep trying and tweaking it. And I think I finally hit on the perfect batch, which happened right after I created this one because I loved this color, but it was too much brown. It was a little too dark, a little too grungy. And while I kind of love some grungy colors, this was just a little too much variation for me. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but there's quite a bit of variation on the sleeve with those flashes of darker brown um, through all of the gold and, and amber colors. And I didn't want that much brown in it. So I recreated this after doing this batch with less of the brown in it and more of kind of that goldy, orangey gold amber color and it's really nice so I think that's finally gonna be the final version that will be coming to my shop fairly soon probably this summer or early fall um, but yeah I just had a few skeins of this so sorry you can't get this exact colorway but you can get one that's even prettier that will be coming um, as the new remixed version of my brass goggles colorway but I liked it certainly well enough to knit it into a quick little easy knit for myself. Um, I really love golds and ambers, so I definitely will wear this. But that's all I have for you this Saturday night at the movies. I hope you enjoy this film. I hope you have something fun to knit while you're watching it. Maybe a Marion sweater? If you decide to knit the pattern, definitely let me know. Um, post it on Instagram or Facebook and tag me so I can see what you're making. And of course, don't forget to tag Andy, the designer as well. She's untangling knots on Ravelry Instagram and all over the interwebs, I believe. And uh, her patterns are fabulous. And if you are not on Ravelry, you can find them on her website. I will put a link to her website below so that you can see her designs down there. And uh, yeah, you should definitely go give her some love. One of the things I love about Andy is her designs are always so incredibly um, easy to follow that they're really great for even beginner knitters as well. They're really pretty quick, simple knits. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and hit subscribe to my channel. Make sure the bell is turned on so that you get all notifications and you never miss an episode. And of course, feel free to share my channel with anyone you think might enjoy the things we do over here in our Fiber Junkie family. We like to do Saturday Night at the Movies, of course, but we also love to do tutorials. Uh, I like to show you what I'm working on, projects I'm doing, um, yarns I'm dyeing, things like that. And we also like to talk about um, kind of some questions on the more technical side of how to work with indie dyed yarns, how to wash your hand knits, how to block, how to cut a steak, different things like that. So we really enjoy just talking all the things knitting, crochet, and fiber. It's a really great time and I'm always enjoying sharing my crafty adventures with you guys. I hope you have a great rest of your week. It is now time to cast off. Love you!